and welcome to the eighth meeting in 2016 of the Health and Sport Committee. <coughs> um, I would ask everyone at this time, as I usually do, to switch off mobile phones as they can interrupt the proceedings of the committee and sometimes the, uh, the sound system. Although you will see that um, some of us are using tablet devices and, and this is instead of our hard copies, uh, hard copies of the papers. First item on the agenda today uh, is a decision on whether the committee will consider its approach to its legacy paper in private at this meeting and indeed uh, 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 at future meetings. Has the committee agreed to meet in private? Yes, thank you. Agenda item number two um, is uh, subordinate legislation, in this case an affirmative instrument. As usual, with affirmative instruments, we'll have an evidence-taking session with the Minister and his officials on the instrument. Once we've heard all of our questions answered, we will then move to the formal debate. The instrument we're looking at today is a Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002, Amendment Order 2016. And we welcome this morning Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health and his officials. Welcome uh, Minister Jamie Hepburn, uh, Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health. Brian Nisbet, uh, Senior Policy Officer, Health and Social Care Integration Directorate. And Claire McKinley, Solicit Solicitor, Scottish Government Legal Director, all from the Scottish Government. Um, Minister, you you have got a prepared statement. Yes, thank convener, you. it's a, a short one, but thank you for the opportunity to come along and say a few words about this a draft order. This order will amend the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman Act 2002 in connection with the establishment of integration joint boards under the public bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. Uh, this order will see the addition of integration joint boards to Schedule 2 of the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman Act 2002. This will have the effect of including uh, integration joint boards as listed authorities for the purpose of the SPSO Act. Any complaints raised against integration joint boards can therefore uh, be dealt with by the Ombudsman uh, going forward. Uh, in addition, uh, complaints procedures used by uh, IGBs must comply with the principles set out by the Ombudsman. This will help to ensure that as we approach the 1st of April 2016, by which time all integrated joint integration joint boards will have taken on the responsibilities, we'll have robust complaints handling procedures in place for all of those boards. The right to seek redress from an external and independent Ombudsman is, we believe, an important right for the public, and by proposing this amendment to the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman Act 2002 to include integration joint boards. We are seeking to make this possible in relation to the planning of integrated uh, services committee. Uh, members will wish to note this order does not take forward any new uh, policy uh, as it is uh, needed simply as a result of wider uh, legislative changes providing for integration of health and social care. But of course, uh, I am very happy to take any uh, questions that uh, any members of the committee might have. Thank you, Minister. We now move to questions and uh, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, people are very interested in the accountability arrangements for um, integrated joint boards and I suppose before anyone has recourse to the Ombudsman they would have to exhaust the complaint procedure. So is the complaint procedure for IGBs con completely contained within the IGB and presumably the, uh, the lead officer or is there, would, would, would the NHS board and local authorities have any role in that or is, is it completely... Uh, restricted, as it were, to the IGB itself. So I think we'd need to be distinct what we're talking about. If we're talking about the exercise of uh, functions on the ground, frontline services, they are uh, covered by existing complaints procedures uh, that already cover uh, the health board or uh, local government. So they're already covered by the, uh, the uh, SPSO, as we'll all be aware. I'm sure we've all had constituents contact us at various times about such it matters if we're talking about the uh, planning of uh, functions through uh, IGBs. Then yes, they'll have their own uh, complaints uh, procedure. We've issued guidance to that effect, and that has to be uh, compliant with the wider SPSO uh, complaints uh, principles. That uh, all uh, bodies they have responsibility have to have uh, a complaints procedure that's uh, adherent uh, to. And this uh, particular order uh, now adds uh, IGBs as a distinct body corporate 
uh, to the list of bodies which uh, an S the SPSO can have uh, uh, oversight of and people can now complain to the SPSO uh, to. But given that most people uh, are, are more likely to make a complaint about the delivery of a service rather than the planning of it, are you saying in terms of the delivery of services there would not be an issue in terms of complaints to the I IGB but, but simply to the local authority or the health board? In essence, in essence, those arrangements are already uh, in place. Uh, the, this would relate more to the uh, delivery of uh, uh, the planning of integrated uh, functions. Well, that's really quite an interesting answer, but uh, I, th I think it probably will add to the confusion that people have about the accountability arrangements because I had a meeting with a particular body yesterday and that's precisely the question that they raised, you know, who is, who is ultimately accountable. So you're actually saying for the, for the services that I understood would be delivered uh, through the IJB, you're actually saying that it's the health board or the local authority that will be accountable, but I thought we were trying to get beyond those distinctions when it came to integrated well, services. That's about the, the delivery of the actual function, so the accountability for planning of those services. So there's an issue around the planning, and I'll maybe bring Brian in just to make sure I'm absolutely correct in what I'm saying here in a second, but around the uh, planning of integrated uh, services that would be that, and we're very clear, and hopefully people will be clear. That's a function of the integrated joint board. But Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add to what I've said. No, that that is the case in, in relation to the planning, uh, the strategic commissioning that uh, the IGBs are responsible for. Adding the SP, uh, adding them to the SPSO Act will allow complaints to be made around the commissioning and the planning function. But service delivery in relation to the NHS and. Uh, social work services would still rest with the local authority and with the NHS complaints procedures. Okay, well, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Nanette. Yeah, I'll go on from that. I mean, what, what if services are provided, say, by the third sector or voluntary sector? How, how do complaints against them? Well, again, I, I uh, suspect that will come down to who's commissioned them, who has ultimate responsibility for them. So the commissioning body would be the body you would uh, uh, complain to. But... Um, uh, you know, it's incumbent on each body. Now we're, uh, we've issued guidance, so integrated joint boards are subject to this uh, process, and health boards and local authorities already are responsible for this in terms of their functions. They come up with their own uh, complaints procedure that's compliant with uh, the broad principles uh, that the SPSO operate to, and um, they would need to take account of any external body they've commissioned for its service delivery as part of that process. Okay. We're, we're simple souls here, and we didn't, I don't think, expected any, uh, uh, you know, sort of controversy around, you know, uh, around this issue. But it would be helpful for me, I think, if, if Brian or Claire or yourself, it doesn't matter, it could give me a for instance about or, a, an, a, or a, an example about how this would add something to the existing process. And what, and, you know, when you talk about planning, you know, what, for instance, uh, would, would, would that look like if someone had a complaint about the planning rather than the delivery of service? Or, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely struggling to, to understand what, 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 what this adds to the process. If, well, like you, uh, can we, I wouldn't view this as a, a controversial matter. I would view this as a, a, a very straightforward matter in that we have now established as body corporate uh, integrated joint boards across the country through uh, the Public uh, Reform uh, Act, uh, Public Bodies, sorry, Joint Working uh, Act of 2014. These are now bodies that are, exist uh, in law and which exercise a public function. And all we are seeking to do here is ensure that if a person has a complaint about the way they have exercised that function, they have a right of redress, they have a right to uh, complain to them in the first instance, and if they're dissatisfied with the way they've handled that complaint, they can then go to the Ombudsman to seek further uh, redress. Now, you're asking me to speculate as to what uh, that might uh, look like. It's obviously hard for me to say because that's theoretical, but I suppose without being very specific uh, about it because... You don't want to uh, invite uh, complaints uh, as such, but uh, if uh, a person feels that the integrated joint board has not followed uh, the processes that they should have in uh, planning and coordinating uh, integrated functions, that might be on the basis in which they seek to complain to an integrated joint board. Uh, what that might be could be very different to different people, and ultimately, of course, uh, it would be subject to the 
complaints procedure and the ombudsman to look at and they could then either uphold the complaint or dismiss it on the grounds that actually the integrated joint board has followed their the proper process that sh they should have. Brother Grant. Just, I suppose, seeking to provide some clarity. If somebody complained, had a complaint about a function carried out by the joint board on behalf of, say, a local government, say it was something about their care at home or something like that, they had a complaint. That Would they complain through the integrated joint board or would they complain to local government or the statutory providers of that service? and Or would they have to complain to both before they went to the ombudsman? I don't believe they'd have to complain to both. Again, it's obviously a hypothetical situation, but I suspect you're referring to actual service delivery, frontline service delivery. And to be clear, that would be the responsibility of, in the instance you have suggested there, uh, Ms Grant, a local government, but equally it could be the health board. So it wouldn't be the joint board? That they Unless it was about the planning or the commissioning of the services. Okay. But again, I can bring in Brian to clarify that if need be. Brian, have you got anything to add to that? I think the, it's, it's, it's an interesting point you raise. I think that the, the thing that's central to this is that any complaint that is made, um, whether it be in relation to service delivery or planning, that is, is dealt with appropriately. Um, if uh, it's a matter of service delivery and the complaint is made to the local authority member of staff in the first instance, the local authority member of staff should pick that up. But if it is in relation to a planning matter, the complaint should be made to the integration joint board. So it would go through the employer. So whoever was employing that member of staff, that, uh, or it might not be a member of staff, it might be the way that the, the service is provided, but whoever is employing the workforce um, of that service, then the complaint goes through. Essentially, I mean, essentially, I suppose to put it at its simplest, uh, Ms. Grant, that the, if you, for example, were seeking to assist a constituent with a complaint that might ultimately go to the ombudsman if it relates to the functions you're talking about, it wouldn't be that dramatically different from the process you go through just now. But who would I write to, I guess? Mike one then. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, just. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to tease out a bit of uh, clarification um, in an effort to be helpful, convener. Um, let's say that you know I or a constituent or I acting on their behalf wrote to um, a local authority or indeed a health board and um, it got it wrong. It was really a, a matter that related to the integrated joint board. Am I correct in assuming that either the local authority or the health board would write back to me or my constituent, dear Mr. McKenzie, um, this complaint, you know, cannot be properly addressed by, you know, the local authority, and we suggest that you take your complaint to the integrated joint board, and vice versa. And so, you know, other than perhaps the cost of a stamp or an email. Um, there would, be no, there would be no real confusion ultimately uh, in terms of people uh, wishing to take their complaint to the right agency. Well, Mr McKenzie is being uh, helpful. I think you're always trying to be helpful, Mr McKenzie, if I could say that. Um, yes, th I think that is it in essence, and obviously we've issued guidance. To, uh, the various bodies involved here have to be clear about their, their particular uh, role. Now, uh, uh, it's always a hostage to fortune, but I rather suspect that most complaints will continue to pertain to frontline delivery, but it is important now that we have created uh, and the processes are already uh, there for uh, such uh, complaints to be taken forward. They're covered by the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman already. Um, but now having created uh, integrated joint boards, um, it is possible that people may want to exercise a complaint against them in the way they've discharged their functions, which are about the planning, commissioning of services, and we have to allow people the right to take forward a complaint first with the body directly and ultimately, if need be, to the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. I would, um, it would be my expectation, I think it would be the expectation of um, the Scottish Government generally that any process which involved a body uh, getting back to say that uh, actually it's not as you should be contacting, it should be the other body, it should be expedited and undertaken as quickly as possible to ensure that any complaint can be taken up with the relevant agency 
and it hopefully resolved satisfactorily quickly thereafter. Well, we don't want to be complicated, but I think we might be getting complicated. Right, Malcolm Chisholm. I just think this is a really interesting discussion because um, I'm, I'm really quite surprised by what you said, to be honest. I mean, m my understanding was that, that, that we're getting beyond this distinction between health and local government in terms of a whole range of services. So if I had a problem, you know, if a constituent had a problem about the delivery of social care, I would have assumed I would have written to the chief, chief officer of the Integrated Joint Board because... I mean, to, to, to make this distinction between oh, the joint boards responsible for planning and then it's up to the separate bodies to th deliver, it's like diluting the whole concept of, of, of integration. So I would put it to you, it would be more appropriate if the integrated joint board also dealt with complaints about the delivery of the services for which they are responsible. I think Otherwise, you're diluting the whole concept. I think we're talking about two separate things, though. We're talk you're talking about delivery on the one hand, Mr Chisholm. We're talking about a complaints function on the other. Now, clearly, it's our hope and aspiration that complaints are few and far between. But nonetheless, I think we're all aware from our own constituency postbag that complaints do uh, come up now and again, and they, they have to be uh, uh, dealt with. But uh, yes, you're right in that the going forward, the delivery of functions should be increasingly integrated, but that is not to say that the particular, you know, the, the, through integration, we're not, um, we're not getting rid of health boards and local authorities. They still are entities in their own right. They still uh, continue to exist and they can still continue to be involved in the delivery of these services. And where the complaint is about a particular element of that service, it is right that they are the, the body that is responsible in the first instance for responding to that uh, complaint about where it's a, a function that they should have been properly exercising. But by its very nature, by bringing um, the two worlds closer together uh, through uh, the health and social care uh, world, then I think will lead to a better uh, service delivery and hopefully we'll see fewer complaints going forward on that basis. Well, I mean, it's very interesting and it does, it does throw a different light on the whole issue of accountability because... It's almost as if you can say whatever is delivered by this body, you will still be able to, to mark it as health or local government for the purposes of complaints, which presumably uh, relates very closely to the issue of accountability. So I find the whole conversation very interesting, but I'm none the wiser about accountability uh, than I was at the beginning. I think you'd be less clear about with the best world in the world. I think you'd be... You, I think you would be justifiably saying to me if we were not doing what we're doing today accountability would be a lot less clearer because we'd have created an entity that ultimately would have no proper complaints procedure and would not be subject to oversight with Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. So I think what we're doing today actually enhances accountability. For this, this, this order, the point I'm making is I thought that uh, it would be accountable for the delivery of services as well as the planning of services. But I suppose that's that, that, that that's a reminder. I suppose you know we we need to point as well to the um, the targeted consultation and the fact that the ombudsman have made favourable comments on the order before us. Is that correct? My my understanding is that um, through that target consultation, everyone who responded to it was in favour of the move we're taking forward here, including the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. I understand that the delegated powers and law reform committee have have no concerns about this uh, order as well convener okay uh is there any other questions i don't think so we now move to agenda item number three uh which is the formal debate on the affirmative ssi which we've just uh, taken evidence and the usual reminders that members should not put questions at this stage to the minister uh, at the formal debates and of course officials can't speak in this debate. I invite the Minister to move the motion before us is 4M15254. It moved, Convener. Thank you. Does any member wish to contribute to the debate? No. Um, I don't presume that the Minister wants to say any fu anything further. No, I, th I think we've covered it in a very useful discussion, Convener. Thank you. Uh, I now put uh, the, the question, that is motion S4M15254 be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, as agreed then, thank you. We just briefly suspend to allow the witnesses to proceed. Thank you very much.
and move to our fourth item on the agenda today, uh, which is consideration of a petition, uh, PE1499 by Robert Watson, on creating suitable respite facilities to support younger disabled adults with life-threatening shortening uh, conditions. Members can see from uh, Paper 3 that the Committee has considered this position, uh, petition as part of its palliative care inquiry, to, uh, inquiry, but also considered the issue of respite care provision for those transitioning from children's to adult hospice and respite services. Uh, these issues were, were discussed at last week's evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary, as you recall, uh, and members uh, um, um, will recall that the Cabinet Secretary that highlighted the work being done by CHAS in determining how young adults are supported and the pilot work being undertaken at, um, is that Luca House, in relation to respite care. Given uh, it appears that uh, action is underway to address the petition, petitioner's concerns. I'm minded to suggest that we close this peti pe petition. Uh, of course, uh, it would um, remain um, open to the petitioner to bring forward another petition if in the fullness of time uh, it transpires that the work currently underway uh, does not improve the services ultimately. Um, and uh, can I have some views from the members? Rhoda Grant. Could we maybe ask um, the petitioner's opinion on what has been suggested in the work that's going on? Obviously, we're coming to the end of the session, so at some point we're going to have to close off the petition. It'll be for the petitioner to come back to the new parliament with another petition if they're concerned. But it might be a good opportunity to get the petitioner's views and feed them into the government as work progresses, given that there'll be a bit of a gap. Get the petitioner's views now about... Yes. The pilot programme is underway. Yes, and, and what they think might need to be added to it, because I, I know respite for young young people, I think, rather than children, is, is, is a real issue all over, not just for palliative care, but... We, we, we can do. We have written to the, the, the petitioner um, um, outlining our, our position. I don't, what response did we...? We've just told them that the work's, the committee's work's underway. Right. I think it would be good to get their view and feed that in, and then, and then close or close and get their views and feed it in if, if that's appropriate. Well, I know, if we, I, if I know if we have to close at some point, but it would be good to. Yeah, to yeah. As a, you know, if, if if the committee feel that way, then we, we can we can tell them what, 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 you know again what we're, we're likely to do, and if they've got any views and. The pilot is taking place. And we can bring it back before the committee. So. Dennis? Uh, yeah, yeah, Kavina, thank you. I, I think my point is that the work that's underway at the moment um, should have time um, to bed in and to be resolved. And if the pe petitioner wishes to monitor the progress of that, he can come back if he's not satisfied, if the points haven't been, a, um, I suppose, a... If, if the areas of work that he feels is required is not being met, then I think you know he's, he could bring back another petition. But I think it would look different from the current one because I, I'm pretty sure that the, the work being undertaken by Chaz will resolve many of the petitioner's uh, concerns. Okay, anyone else? Fiona? Um, if I recall correctly, convener last week when I asked um, the Cabinet Secretary and her officials about the work that was ongoing and the work they're doing with Lukey and um, Marie Curie Glasgow, we were given time scales for reporting back on that work. So perhaps in closing the petition, it might be useful for us to send that reference to the petitioner. Okay. Um, I think... I think, uh, Malcolm? I mean, I'm interested in the petitioner's comment. The danger may be that respite care is lost in the focus, and that is the primary objective um, um, of, of my petition. So, I, I mean, I'm not entirely clear because I haven't been here all the time this 
petitions being uh, being dealt with, but they seem to be expressing concern that it's only f that, that we've only focused on palliative care, whereas respite care um, presumably could apply to to people a much wider range no, no. of people. So, um, oh, sorry, Malcolm. Uh, so I, I'm, I mean, I, there's an issue in Lothian at the moment about respite care being taken away from people who used to use a, a unit called the land fine unit and I've certainly had a constituent with um, um, who's, who's lost his respite as a result of that and I mean Lothian would argue they've remodeled the service but the fact of the matter is that some people have lost out so that's the kind of dimension that's coming to me um, at the moment I haven't really as I say been closely involved with this petition but um, I don't think there's probably any option to to closing it at this stage, but it may be that we haven't quite captured the, the breadth of the concern of the uh, petitioner uh, by focusing on palliative care um, rather than the broader kind of respite issue that's oh, being raised. Okay. Fiona and then Rosa. My recollection from the evidence we heard from the Cabinet Secretary officials last week was that it was also about respite care and that they gave us time scales for reporting on those pilots. Rosa. I think just to make the point that hospice, children's hospice care is very different from adult hospice care. It is about respite, it is about, and the fact that we are having young people grow up in the, the children's hospice movement, probably from birth on to when they're leaving in adulthood. Um, and that support is really important to them, not just for their families for respite, but for themselves socially, that they can do what they want to do without having being dependent on their families and then they come out into an adult system which is totally different palliative care it's about very much at the end of life rather than for life limiting conditions so you know I think there are concerns here and I wouldn't just like to be seen to tick the boxes if sorted I think there, there will be ongoing issues that's why I would be keen to kind of get the petitioner's views yeah. to feed that into the process. It might, it might have been with a, a, a better position if we'd, you know, we, we agreed that we would deal with this petition and our evidence of palliative care. We're slightly suggesting that that, 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 that should be, be different at this point. Um, and Mother Kitchen, that though Marie Curie and Charles, although it's on that focus of palliative care, that was the process that we were going along. We decided to deal with this petition as as as, as we took evidence on palliative end of life care. Now, Chads are directly involved with it's about what a committee is expected to do with a petition, I think. And I think as a committee, we agreed that we would deal with this and suggested that to the petitioner and uh, let them know that in, a, in our general evidence with palliative care. We, the issues that were raised in the petition were raised directly with the Cabinet Secretary. Charles is directly involved. Murray Curie is directly involved. And I just feel we're maybe just, you know, not objecting to it, but I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give the petitioner a, a false expectation that we're going on another, another, another route here because... We are cons we, I think we've approached it as cons consistently as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. We informed the petitioner that that's what we're going to do, and it was a focus on palliative care. The people who are directly Im involved are, I think, able to deal with, with these issues through the pilot and, and others. And, and I, mean, I, I don't know, other than either coming off the sort of... The, the, the parameters that we, we that we were falling to deal with this, and you know, we, we, you're, you're suggesting now that it wasn't just about palliative care; it was about it was about uh, lifelong conditions, and we did we didn't approach it like that. And I don't I don't I don't I don't know. But you can ask for the indulgence. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, if we, if we want to leave it live for a couple of weeks, but I need we, we need to know then what we're discussing in the next couple of weeks and and the petitioner, how he's going to respond to his petition and how he's, you know, uh, making it. Uh, you know, I just don't know where we're going. Yes? Uh, it's, it's, it's not 
lifelong conditions as such. It's life-limiting conditions. What we've got is conditions where children, I suppose, were conditions that children would not have reached adulthood if they suffered from in the past are now living, which is great, yeah. are living beyond that because of advances in medicine. And there is a gap there for people who have had that kind of support in their youth and then are not getting that support going forward. So I th I'm, I'm not suggesting... I know we can't keep the petition open and I know we agreed to deal, it, deal with it that way. And I know the government are trying to do something about this. All I'm suggesting is we get the petitioner's view and feed it into government because I think that's important when you're piloting something um, not, and not keep the petition going. Annette and Mike. So I agree with Rhoda on this. I mean, I first <coughs> heard about this, the, the ongoing situation at Chaz um, during the cross-party group um, on muscular dystrophy. And the, the particular group of people was the Duchenne muscular atrophy people who, who are finding they are now surviving into adult life. And they, I think what Rhoda said is exactly right. You know, they need, they need respite. Ultimately, they may well need palliative care as well. But the, they do, the, the respite was quite a significant part of what was said. Now, I think this petition, if I remember, arose from one of these people, um, if I remember correctly. And I, I, so I well, do agree with Rhoda. I'm fairly with the committee. It, 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 you know, I suppose what I'm struggling with is that what the, 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 once the petition comes to us, we progress that. Of course, we, 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 we communicate and we let the petitioner know what we're doing with it. But, but, and, and it's about how we have dealt with it I'm focusing on. Uh, on. And one of our recommendations, the committee welcomes the joint work of the Scottish Government and CHAS and currently undertaking to look at how respite services for young adults can be improved and increased. You know, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, Chaz commented on uh, the importance of respite in our report, and you know, so uh, you know, I think the petitioner's concerns have been addressed by the committee in its report, in its recommendations, and in its evidence taken. I don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, what what more we can do. When we have a response for the cabinet secretary, all this what's going on and pilots are taking place and it's been looked at with consideration, and of, and, and, of, and, of, and of, of course people can make representation to that, you know. So, Mike, I mean, I, I agree absolutely with what you're saying, convener. I was greatly reassured by what the cabinet secretary was saying, but um, I just wonder if it would help, given that we're going to be discussing our legacy paper later on in today's meeting. Um, to let the petitioner know that uh, this is something that you know we can look forward to the, the you, you know the the um, the work that's going forward on this general issue, including respite, and that it's something that we can ask our successor committee to you know revisit or monitor at some appropriate time in the future. And if that would maybe um, give some reassurance to you know to Rhoda and uh, to Nanette as well as to the I, petitioner. I think the committee have done a good job in this. I, mm. I, I, we're in a situation mm. where <laughs> we're almost... Nanette? I don't think there's any point in keeping the petition open because we have done everything that was, was asked um, of the petition. But I, I, I quite like Mike's suggestion that we, we do just put it as a small part of our legacy paper. Aye. Agreed. To help... The petitioner wants to make comment to the Scottish Government. The petitioner can make comment. Oh, indeed, to the, the committee. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, as agreed at the previous committee, we now move uh, to um, private session, and I suspend the meeting at this point uh, to, to clear the room. <laughs>